Hi there, so now let's look at the next sword in the Royal Armouries Windlass Eastern line, uh, which is IX-16, which is a longsword. Not only is it a longsword, it's an English longsword. The original, which entered the Tower of London Armouries uh, before they moved to their current main site in Leeds, the Royal Armouries, um, it entered the collection quite some time ago and was found in the River Thames. Now, that doesn't necessarily therefore mean that it was English made. It could have been English made. It could have been imported, but it was found in England. And it dates to around 1400 to 1430, which of course, for the uh, eagle-eyed amongst you, you will notice that puts it exactly in the time frame of Henry V's campaigning in France, most famously the Battle of Agincourt, but everything that ran up to the uh, 1420s as well. So this is the type of longsword that could have been carried by Henry V or any of his uh, comrades during that campaign in the Hundred Years' War. And it's a longsword. It's a longsword typical of the early 15th century. So first of all, let's have a quick look at the scabbard. The scabbard is wood-lined, leather-covered, very nicely stitched up the back with a bronze shape at the end and a rain guard, if we call it that. Um, the blade itself you will notice is quite tapered. So it starts off uh, a little bit broader at the base here and tapers pretty much in a straight line down to a very robust piercing point, which is very much designed to deal with the armor of the day. So thrusting into the gaps of plate armor, particularly where there might be mail, aka chain mail, like at the armpits or uh, groin, places like this, back of the knees, uh, places where it can potentially try and pierce through the mail to some extent, or indeed if there's no mail in a particular gap to pass through the arming doublet that's worn underneath the mail. So a very effective thrusting point, but nevertheless a blade which is also capable of cut and thrust. And in the hand, this handles very nimbly this sword. And you'll notice it's got a fair length grip uh, for its proportions a hand and a half grip. So this sword is actually quite comfortable to use in one hand. It's not as nimble as a one-handed sword would be because obviously it's a bit longer and it's got a longer hilt and it's a little bit heavier. This weighs incidentally um, in uh, just below 1500 grams. So it's not, uh, it's neither a heavy sword nor a light sword really. It's a kind of average weight for a long sword of this size. Um, it's got a fair length grip as you'll see and it has what's called a scent stopper pommel. The cross guard incidentally is purely straight and this is one of the simplest guards that we had to replicate. Um, but this particular sword is quite well published. It appears in a lot of books because it's a kind of almost a typical 15th century longsword as much as you get with one main difference that's really notable about it. And I'm going to show you here, and this was the bit that was the most difficult to get right with this sword. It has a very specifically designed ricasso. Now this ricasso is more or less blunt at the edges. It's not thick, so it's not like a thick, thick ricasso, but it's clearly sort of reinforced and they've also gone for some hollow grinding. So we've got essentially a, a flat section up the middle which runs up to the back the middle of the blade and then we've got these hollow ground sections fore and aft of that central flat section. So the base of the blade is, you could say octagonal, it's kind of hexagonal but it's got slightly flat faces on the edges here, very very slightly. So it's, um, it's sort of octagonal in literal terms but looks more hexagonal. Then it has a sort of step transition here and again that was quite challenging to get that right. It has a step transition and then the edges meet from here onwards and this is a true hexagonal blade at this point. So it has a flat section in the middle and then uh, directly um, straight beveled edges down to this point at which it transitions again and it transitions from hexagonal to flattened diamond section. That is therefore it has a mid rib at this point onwards. So essentially we've got uh, flattened diamond section here, hexagonal here, octagonal here. So it was quite a difficult blade to get right. The result, as I say, in the hand, it's a very nimble and quick sword and it handles, it handles like the sort of long sword actually that you'd want to use either out of armor or in armor. Uh, this would make, it is a fairly thick blade incidentally. Um, if I remember correctly, it's uh, close to eight millimeters at the base of the blade. It's about six and a half millimeters at the middle of the blade. So it, it maintains 
quite a stiff cross section. And you'll notice I cannot flex it very much. It does flex where it does flex in the second half of the blade because it does have this distal taper, which means that it is thinner in the second half of the blade, which adds to the nice handling of the sword. But nevertheless, it maintains quite a thick cross section. So for fighting in armor, for half swording, for using as a lever, it still works very well but it's not super, super thick, so you've still got relatively good edge geometry uh, for a cutting blade down here. It's not gonna be the, the best cutter in the world, but it's a good compromise cut and thrust sword for a, particularly for an armored knight, that would still be effective against clothing and flesh in a dueling or kind of street defense situation, but would also be useful as an armored fighting sword in armor half swording as well. Um, the cross guard incidentally is just purely a straight bar as the original is, uh, but it does swell around and you'll notice it is cut to fit around the blade exactly and it fits very precisely in there. The grip, um, I elected to go with an octagonal grip because I think it looks particularly good with this sword and it echoes the faces, the facets of this pommel. So you'll notice that each of these flat faces of the pommel follows down into the grip and I think that has a particularly nice looking gothic and geometric look to it. And I had them put risers in the middle of the grip, which is always useful on long swords because it stops the hands if you're using it one handed, for example, on horseback or because you're using a shield or whatever, you're grabbing, grabbing someone. It means that when you're using the sword one handed, the hand is less inclined to slide down the grip in use. OK, so it helps keep the hand in place. And we've also got risers at top and bottom uh, to just sort of frame the grip as well. And you'll notice that the grip is very nicely leather wrapped with cord impression to give friction and give a really, really good grip. And the seam um, of the glued leather over the top is very nice and smooth, no friction there that's gonna worry anyone. So a very, very nicely finished, and I would say this is the type of longsword that you would see in lots of the fencing treatises out there like Fiore or Talhofer, Paulus Cal, uh, Ringek, these types of things. So. This is a good multi-purpose, every role, uh, universal uh, longsword could be used in armor, out of armor, and handles absolutely beautifully. And for anyone who's interested in English history, the fact that it was found in the River Thames and dates to the Agincourt period probably won't go missed either. So if you're looking at uh, that particular period of history, this will probably be of particular interest to you. Thanks a lot for watching.